Today marks 24 years since UAlbany student Suzanne Lyle vanished without a trace. The 19 year old was last seen on campus not far from her college dorm. More than two decades later, the case remains unsolved, but the hope for answers is still very much alive. Welcome back to another episode of the Solvable Mysteries podcast. My name is Juras. I'm going to be your host this week. Um, this is episode number 146. We're going to be looking at the Suzanne Leol's disappearance this week. I've spent a lot of time researching this case, and um, I think I have a pretty good picture of what's happening here. So I would like to begin uh, this podcast, as I always do, by reading the introduction into this case and once that's over let's really delve deeper into what's happening in this bizarre disappearance case suzanne leal is an american woman who mysteriously disappeared on the night of march 2nd 1998 from albany new york at the time of her disappearance suzanne was an undergraduate computer science student at the State University of New York at Albany. Suzanne was 19 years of age when she disappeared. She is 5 foot 3 in height. She weighed around 175 pounds. She has blue eyes. When she went missing, her hair was light brown and had highlights. Some of Suzanne's distinguishing physical characteristics include a light brown birthmark on her left calf, a mole on her left cheek beneath her earlobe, and a surgical scar on her left foot. Suzanne Leol was last seen on the evening of March 2nd, 1998 at approximately 9.20 p.m. as she left her work at the Crossgates Mall in Albany, New York, where she worked at a software retail store called Babbage's. Suzanne had boarded a bus heading to Collins Circle at the State University of New York. It is believed that she exited the bus at Collins Circle at approximately 9.45 p.m. and has not been seen since that time. Suzanne grew up in Bolston Spa, New York. She was the youngest of Doug and Mary Leol's three children. Her two other siblings, older sister Sandy and older brother Steve, described her as the darling of the family. Now, growing up, she was a quiet girl who enjoyed writing poetry in her notebook after inspiration struck her. She was also a fan of the Canadian power trio called Rush. Suzanne showed an interest in computers and was known to be an avid computer user and enjoyed spending time conversating online. She was even building computers from scratch in her childhood. Once Suzanne graduated from Boston Spa High School with honors in 1996, she first attended the State University of New York in Winota for just one year, after which she transferred to University of New York at Albany. Since she felt the computer science courses at Winota University, were not challenging enough. The move to Albany brought Suzanne closer to her home as Albany was just 30 miles away from Boston Spa where she had grew up. Moving to Albany also meant that she was now closer to her boyfriend Richard Condon who was a fellow student several years her senior whom she had started dating when they were both still in high school. Richard also had an interest in computers. The two of them would frequently chat back and forth online. Richard had set up Suzanne's computer in such a way that he could access it remotely from his computer and would gain access 
to her files. When Suzanne went missing, she had two off-campus jobs. One of them was a computer company in Troy, which is 8 miles away from Albany, and the other was at Babbage's software store in Crossgate Mall, mentioned earlier in the introduction. It was around 2 miles west of her campus. Suzanne would keep in contact with her parents and her boyfriend Richard on a daily basis. She would either call or email them every day. Suzanne's mother, Mary Leol, recalls that the last time she spoke to her daughter on March 1st, 1998, Suzanne had complained about her finances. She told her mother she was low on cash and was waiting for her next paycheck. When Mary offered some money, Suzanne declined the offer. In late February of 1998, just days before Suzanne's disappearance, her manager at Babbage's recalled that she had been stressed about an upcoming midterm exam. Suzanne took these exams the morning of March 2nd, on the same day that she had disappeared. After the exams, Suzanne attended other classes until 4 p.m. Once her classes were over, she went from the school's north campus, where she lived in the colonial quad dorm, to her job at Babbage's. According to her manager, she felt she had done okay on the exam. She worked there until the store closed at 9 p.m. in the evening, then got on a Capital District Transportation Authority bus going back to campus at around 9.20 p.m. The bus driver confirmed that he had seen her board the bus. However, he was not certain if she got off at the Collins Circle bus stop on the school's campus, which was just a short walk from her dorm. The driver could only say with certainty that Suzanne was not on the bus when he reached the end of the bus route downtown. A friend of Suzanne's came forward after her disappearance and told investigators she had seen Suzanne exit the bus at the Collins Circle bus stop. According to the friend, this happened around 9.45 p.m. in the evening. The next morning on March 3rd, her boyfriend Richard Condon, who attended a different college in the Albany area, called Doug and Mary Leol to tell them that Suzanne had not returned to her dorm the night before and was now missing. The reason why Richard was the first to notice Suzanne was missing was because Suzanne had a habit of calling or emailing him right after work, but on this occasion, she hadn't called or emailed. When Richard tried calling her dorm room, no one answered his calls. Suzanne's parents called the campus police to formally report her missing and were told that brief absences were not uncommon for college students, so they should not worry. Suzanne's father, on the other hand, immediately knew something was very wrong. According to him, quote, Susie was not a risk taker. She didn't party or use alcohol or drugs, end quote. An officer went to her next scheduled class, however Suzanne was not there. When they questioned some of her fellow students, they told the officer that Suzanne did not return to her room on the night of March 2nd, as they would have heard her keys and fobs jingling as they normally did when she returned. In the first two weeks of the investigation, police looked into 270 leads and searched 300 acres near Collins Circle, including the wooded area and Rensselaer's Lake. However, nothing significant was uncovered. A mysterious clue was uncovered when it was realized that Suzanne's debit card had been used to withdraw $20 from an ATM at a steward's shop's convenience store in Albany at approximately 4 p.m. the following day on March 3rd. 
The Stewart's Shop Convenience Store, where the ATM was located, had a security camera, but it focused on the area around the cashier and did not show the ATM itself, so it could not be determined who was using it at the time. An interesting detail worth mentioning is that whomever used the debit card knew the correct PIN code because it was determined that the PIN code was correctly entered on the first attempt. Boyfriend Richard Condon stated that he and Suzanne were the only two people who knew the PIN code for this debit card. Suzanne's parents stated that Suzanne would always withdraw exactly $20 anytime she went to an ATM. Let's remember that this is the same amount that has been withdrawn from this ATM the following day on March 3rd. Doug and Mary Leol told investigators that Stewart's store located on the intersection of Central Avenue and Manning Boulevard, two miles southeast of the campus, was not in a part of the city that Suzanne frequented. The suspicions arose further when the Stewart's store's clerk on duty at the time did not recognize Suzanne. A bizarre twist in the case occurred when a sketch of a black man who may have used Suzanne's debit card at that store at the same time was released to the public. Now, the man wore a Nike baseball cap and was sought as a possible witness or person of interest by law enforcement. It's unclear why law enforcement thinks this man could have used the credit card. As to my understanding, this information has not been released. However, police did eventually locate this man from the sketch. I believe the man actually came forward himself. Now, after speaking to this man in the Nike baseball cap, law enforcement believed he had nothing to do with the case, although they could not completely rule him out. The bank later informed police that Suzanne's card was used to make two withdrawals from different ATMs on the day when she disappeared, March 2nd. The first had been made in the morning at the machine near Collins Circle bus stop, and the other was in the mall at about the time she would have arrived there for work, both had been for $20, so it seemed likely that she had made them. Now, Suzanne's mother, Mary, on the other hand, could not imagine why her daughter would have made two different withdrawals in one day, as she would usually only make one withdrawal. Investigators analyzed whether there could be any possible links to a similar disappearance of another Albany undergraduate, Karen Louise Wilson, who had disappeared 13 years earlier, near where Suzanne has last been seen. According to my research, Karen had disappeared only a half a mile away from the Collins Circle bus station. Similarly to Suzanne's disappearance, Karen was thought to be heading towards the University at Albany on foot, and was last seen by witnesses around 8.15 p.m. in the evening. Karen was 22 years of age when she disappeared, while Suzanne was just 19. Other than the similar circumstances, investigators found no connection between these two cases. A convicted rapist who had violated parole and left the area around the same time Suzanne disappeared was briefly considered a suspect as well, but police interviewed him after he was returned to New York from Illinois and excluded him. Because the bus driver that drove the bus that Suzanne was riding 
was uncertain whether Suzanne had indeed disembarked at the Collins Circle bus station, police also began considering the possibility that she might have never returned to campus that night. Some investigators even theorized that she might not even have gotten on the bus at all. Another critical clue in this case was uncovered about two months after Suzanne's disappearance when her Babbage's name tag was found about 90 feet away from the bus stop in the parking lot, opposite from the direction she would have walked if she was returning to her dorm. It could not be determined how long it had been there, and police could recover no forensic evidence from it. Suzanne's father, Doug Leal, told CBS News, quote, There was an old employee ID badge found two months later of the visitor's parking lot at the Colin Circle in kind of a grassy area that had been out there for quite a period of time, end quote. Another theory indicating a potential abduction in this case came from a co-worker of Suzanne's. The co-worker told investigators that Suzanne had told her about a month prior to her disappearance that she believed a stranger was stalking her. The co-worker also added that Suzanne did not appear to be afraid of this potential stalker. In 2005, a man named John Regan, who was facing trial for a 1993 kidnapping in Connecticut, was arrested after trying to abduct a female student at Saratoga Springs High School by pulling her into his van from the street near the school. Because this high school is a short distance from Ballston Spa, Suzanne's hometown, police and the family wondered if John Regan might have been responsible for Suzanne's disappearance. John, on the other hand, was convicted of the attempted kidnapping, however, he refused to discuss Suzanne's case with investigators. Boyfriend Richard Condon has been the center of attention in Suzanne Leal's disappearance for a very long time now. Police have never been able to entirely rule him out as a suspect in this case. Mary Leal, Suzanne's mother, told the media that her daughter tried to end their relationship on multiple occasions, but each time Richard would become emotional and convince Suzanne to stay with him. Richard told police that Suzanne was his fiancée. This was a bizarre development as Suzanne's parents were never informed about this uh, from their daughter. Two weeks before Suzanne disappeared, Mary recalled she and her daughter had been on a trip to see Mary's mother when Suzanne asked if they could stop at Richard's house, which was along their way. Suzanne said that she wanted to give Richard a Valentine's Day card. While nothing unusual happened during the brief stop, Mary said in 2012, that she wondered if her daughter had in fact given Condon a Dear John letter instead of a Valentine's Day card, ending their relationship potentially. Suzanne's mother also contemplated if Suzanne could have been seeing someone else at the time of her disappearance, however police have never found any evidence regarding this. Richard had an alibi for the time when Suzanne disappeared. He was playing video games with a friend, and the friend confirmed this when asked by police. It's worth mentioning that some sources stated that they have been playing video games online, not in the same location. If this is true, then that would mean that the friend didn't actually see Richard playing, and would have to verify this alibi based on remote communication. After the initial conversation with police, Richard refused to take a lie detector test and told them he would be interviewed again only if his lawyer was present. He also refused to answer questions from the media about the case in later years. His mother told CBS back in 2010 that he had married 
and moved on with his life. Suzanne Leal's case remains open to this day, and the state police continue to follow up on any leads that come in. Doug Leal died in 2015, while his wife Mary still continues to be an activist for missing person cases. Mary also keeps on searching for her missing daughter as well. Over the years, around 75 psychics have contacted the Leol family with tips. Many of them have involved water, suggesting that Suzanne is dead and her body has been submerged somewhere. While Mary Leol has dismissed these claims because there are so many bodies of water in the surrounding area, she nevertheless told the media back in 2016 that she has persistently experienced an odd feeling anytime she was driving across the Crescent Bridge along the US Route 9 over the Mohawk River between Albany and Boston Spa. In June of that year, a company that does high-tech mapping applied its technology to the river's bottom in the area. It has not been reported whether anything significant was uncovered. In 2018, New York State Police senior investigator John Camp said, We believe it's a homicide. Is there a chance she moved away? It's a possibility, but the reality is she's probably been a victim of a homicide. We need someone to come forward who knows the case or has knowledge of the case that has information. At the time of this recording, Suzanne has been missing for over 24 years. If she's still alive, she would now be 43. All right. Uh, now I'm sharing my screen, guys. So for everyone who's listening to this on the YouTube channel, uh, not on the YouTube channel, I mean, you could always go ahead and uh, glance. I really quickly just want to note down a few interesting uh, points in the map. Um, so this is a Boston Spa, that little town in the state of New York where Suzanne grew up. This is a university at Wanyota where she went to study computer science uh, because, you know, she was really into that. Uh, now, zooming into the Albany area, this is the University at Albany. This is the one that she was studying at. I believe she was living at the Colonial Quad Dorm, which is this dorm right here. Uh, she was, Suzanne was working at the Crossgate Mall at Babbage's. Uh, Babbage's is some sort of a software retailer. Now, they're part of uh, GameStop, from what I've gathered. Uh, this is the Circle... Uh, Collins Circle. This is that point. This is the area where uh, Suzanne disappeared. So she took a bus. Suzanne took a bus from Crossgate Mall at 9.20 p.m. in the evening, something like that. Now, I don't know the exact route, but one way or another, the bus entered the Collins Circle's bus stop. Now, the uh, bus uh, driver, he doesn't recall whether or not Suzanne uh, disembarked at this particular stop, but one of Suzanne's friends did see her, but this is just an eyewitness account and it could not be verified. Uh, also, let's remember that somewhere around this location right here, Suzanne's, uh, you know, that ID card from Babbage's was found. It was found two months later, and I think it was an old version of the ID card, so it's, it's actually impossible to say whether or not uh, Suzanne uh, lost that ID card recently or this may have happened even like months prior because that was the old version of the ID card. Um, I think it's also worth mentioning that if we're gonna go to the time, uh, time, uh, time like let's go back in time on the Google Maps, right? Uh, we're looking at the satellite footage from 2001. And in the satellite footage in 2001, as you can see, we do not have that bus stop uh, outlined as much as, it, basically there's nothing there. And this case happened in 1998. So uh, three years prior to this satellite footage being taken, uh, the father of Suzanne, Doug, 
Liao, he said that the ID card was found somewhere in a greenish, like a greenery area. So it assumes somewhere here, because we do know that the card was found around, uh, what was it like, uh, around 20, 30 meters from the bus stop itself. So it's pretty safe to say it was found in this location now. Uh, if uh, Suzanne would have just went back to her dorm, she would probably have to take route something like that, right? Just walking uh, westwards to the dorms. Uh, but it was stated in the timeline that the ID card was actually found in the opposite direction uh, from the dorm. So I'm not really sure where. Um, also, there could be a chance that maybe this was the bus stop. So. Uh, it's unfortunate, we can't really verify it, but actually, since I've looked into this case, I don't think that this particular detail is actually quite that important. Wanna quickly jump back to the relevant map, right? So once again, University of Al at Albany, all good, all good. This is the shop, and I was able to verify that this is the steward's shop where Suzanne's uh, credit, uh, debit card was actually used the following day after she disappeared. So on March 3rd, around 4 p.m. in the afternoon, her debit card was actually used. Now let's remember that um, there isn't any CCTV footage that was overlooking the ATM. There was CCTV, but it was only overlooking the cashier. So we can't really tell who actually used the debit card. Um, interesting fact how I managed to basically verify that this is the uh, steward's shop is because if we would just look at it from the street view angle right now, I'm actually gonna jump to a new station art. Uh, I think we're gonna jump to this shortly, but uh, just uh, really quickly, though this is probably weird, this, this right here, this is how I was able to verify that this is the steward shop in question, because look, the, okay, <laughs> I guess this is the one thing that made me think that this was not the steward shop, is that we have the entrance and we have three windows, what seems to be like three windows in the left direction from the door. If we would go back to the map, uh, to the street view, we only have two windows. So this was the only thing that made me question whether or not this was the actual steward's shop. But uh, if we're gonna zoom out, and I'm actually, I actually pinpointed all of the steward shops in the general location, so we can actually see them. And uh, as you can see, this is the closest one, and I think it was the because we have a steward shop here, steward shop here, I think steward shop here, but I definitely think this is this, right? The steward shop was this, this one. I know this is probably weird for people who are listening to this. This is a map heavy episode, guys. Um, yeah, and uh, we'll jump back into these details. Uh, let's see, let's see, anything else? This is Troy that other small town a little bit uh, northeast from Albany. This is where uh, Suzanne had another job. I don't know, it was some sort of a computer related job as well. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, we have the Crescent Bridge a little bit north from, uh, you know, Albany. This is the bridge where Suzanne's mother, Mary, told um, the media back in 2006 that whenever she would drive over this bridge, she would have like an uneasy feeling and expert act experts actually looked into this whole entire area right here i think they were like using some sort of a sonar type of a thingy majiggy right and they kind of tried to see if there's anything on the bed of this area don't think they found anything and yeah that's pretty much it Okay, guys, I literally have uh, croissants in the oven, so I think we have like another uh, 10 minutes Re really quickly. I wanted to jump back to the map because I also wanted to uh, talk a little bit about the points uh, marked in the yellow color. Um, I, mo I marked all of these points in this map 
that are marked in the yellow color are actually of other similar cases that could potentially be connected to Suzanne Leal's disappearance. Um, let's jump immediately to the one that's, uh, I think, if any of those are connected, then probably the Karen Wilson one is probably the, the most likely one to be connected because um, let's remember that Karen, Karen Wilson also disappeared uh, and the, even the investigators, they actually stated that the disappearance is like the circumstances are very similar. So um, Karen Wilson, she was also a student. I think she was a political science uh, student also at the University at Albany. And she um, disappeared 13 years earlier. So she disappeared on, I believe, 1985. And um, there is there are three witnesses. And there's a general timeline that I've actually looked into a little bit. And I wanted to... Um, you know, place her location point on the map as well. So we know for a fact that uh, she, uh, Karen Wilson, actually, uh, at first she went to the uh, Colony Center, which is a mall, to buy some sort of a t-shirt or something like that. So she went to this mall, which is a little bit north from, um, you know, the University of Albany, but it's still walking distance for sure. Um, so she went there by 7.20 p.m. in the evening, and she made her way down this street right here. Um, and uh, tr three different witness uh, witnesses place her last uh, location at this intersection right here and uh, they place her at 8 15 p.m and she disappeared um there were some people allegedly following her uh, but she vanished uh, you know uh, long story short and if we would look at the map um, Collins Circle bus stop where Suzanne was last seen is actually just half a mile away from where uh, Karen Wilson disappeared. Now, I don't put too much weight into there being any sort of a connection between these two cases, mainly because uh, it's all just, I guess, circumstantial. And these two um, disappearances happened 13 years apart from each other. So I'm um, not really sure what to make of that. And then we also have this location right here. Uh, this is in connection to John Regan, uh, the same man who uh, attempted to abduct a student from the uh, Saratoga Springs High School uh, back in 2005. Now this man, John Regan, I didn't have the time or the opportunity to look into him more in depth. Maybe this is on me to do so uh, later on, but uh, apparently this man, he was already on, uh, like he was already um, in trouble because uh, he had some sort of a, he had some sort of kidnapping charges from 1993. So this guy actually was snatching people up back in the early 90s. And, uh, you know, Suzanne disappears in uh, 1998. Um, you know, the place where John Regan was apprehended was actually, uh, you know, Saratoga Springs High School. Saratoga Springs is pretty close to Boston Spa, the place where, um, you know, Susan grew up, so maybe this doesn't necessarily connect him to Albany, but maybe, uh, you know, this kind of a, this, you know, this situation with John Regan maybe connects him to the general, you know, location, the general area. But once again, I don't think it, uh, law enforcement ever, you know, uncovered anything that would connect uh, John Regan to Suzanne's disappearance, but I definitely, definitely think it's worth mentioning for sure. Looking at the images uh, from this case, uh, there are actually a few interesting images uh, that we can actually find online, and uh, I guess let's just look at uh, the pictures from Suzanne Leal. So actually, for someone who was apparently uh, a quiet, shy person, there's a bunch of images and some videos. We're actually going to watch a video really quickly um, regarding this case, right? So um, Suzanne Leal, uh, you know, we can see her. Uh, I think she was 5'3", uh, 175 pounds, if I'm not mistaken. 
uh, 19 years of age. We have some pictures of her. Uh, this is an interesting uh, visual asset right here. Um, for everyone who is listening to this, pardon the cough, uh, on the YouTube channel, Jesus Christ, um, we're looking at the ID card that um, was uncovered um, close to that uh, bus stop. Uh, in the Collins Circle. And I think this was an old ID card. Uh, so that's a bizarre key detail right there. You know what I mean? Like, uh, who left it there? Did she lose the ID card on, like, herself? Or was this a potential staging of the crime? Did someone potentially acquire this ID card somehow and placed it in the general facility where she was last seen in order to stage the crime make it look more of a staged uh you know make it more make it look like an uh, abduction or something like that who knows right um this is uh the i guess sketch that was released by law enforcement when they were looking for the black man in the nike baseball cap um once again this particular detail was really bizarre uh we can see the sketch of this man apparently this man actually uh, turned himself in. He went and he talked to law enforcement. And after talking to law enforcement, uh, it was determined by Ali that he had nothing to do with um, Suzanne's disappearance. And I would probably feel confident uh, to state that, yeah, this guy probably didn't have anything to do with Suzanne's disappearance just because he turned himself in. And after doing that, police were like, yeah, there's probably a good rational explanation uh, why, uh, you know, he was at the store. But that's the interesting part here. Uh, and I want to quickly circle back to the map really quickly to that steward's shop where, uh, you know, uh, Suzanne's uh, debit card was used by an unknown individual. It might have been Suzanne herself, who knows, but uh, we just know that there is an ATM within the store. And we're going to review some footage really quickly um, that will kind of show where the ATM looks and will just kind of show us the you know, like the interior of this shop. But, you know, the uh, CCTV uh, footage didn't cover uh, the ATM itself, just the cashier. Um, interesting uh, thing is that for me personally, when this black man uh, in a Nike baseball cap, when this thing kind of, you know, when I was reading about it, I was like, how do they connect? Uh, how how did this even happen? How did this guy came into the attention of law enforcement? Like, because at one point it was described that this man potentially used Suzanne's debit card on the ATM. And then I kind of looked at some articles and it seems that this man in the baseball cap, he actually was uh, seen by a witness using the ATM, uh, uh, like apparently at the same time as... Uh, Suzanne's debit card was used. So let's remember that Suzanne's debit card was used around 4 p.m. on March 3rd. So that would mean that this black man from, you know, uh, the sketch, he was also seen by someone using the ATM at like approximately the same time. But I would assume there's not a lot of people uh, exiting and entering the store. Um, so maybe uh, just him being there and using the ATM card in the generally similar, you know, time, uh, maybe it made the police suspicious because to me that pretty much shows that this ATM wasn't used regularly. Probably around 4 p.m. there wasn't a line of people trying to use the ATM. I think it's, you know, I think it's a good, uh, good thing to think about and uh, to, you know, try to evaluate this as much as possible. Um, some other interesting things I've managed to find um, uh, were, oh, basically, you know, just another interesting talking point for us is the distance from Collins Circle at Albany, the bus stop, right, and this steward's shop. So I've done the Google Maps distances, and it seems that there is you know, by car, it would take eight minutes to get to this location. Um, so, you know, let's remember March, uh, which is what March is uh, the third month, right? So 
March, uh, March 2nd, right? 9, uh, 40 p.m. This is when, uh, Suzanne was last seen, uh, here in the circle, you know, in the bus stop, and then in the steward's shop right here, uh, the card was used at 0303, so the following day on March 3rd at 4 p.m. So the distance, as we can see, is 2.7 uh, miles uh, by car, that would be 8 minutes, and by foot, I have it here, by foot it would be 54 minutes. Uh, to walk down there. So I, I don't want to get into the theories just now. I just want to kind of paint the picture for you guys. And I guess, you know, we can all make our own conclusions uh, in the end of the show. This is an interesting PDF. This is a PDF that I've uncovered from a, I'm not sure, this was uh, on some sort of a governmental agency, something to do with law enforcement. This is basically the information regarding the Karen Wilson disappearance, you know, the other woman who went missing 15 years earlier. So I've, uh, you know, this PDF was actually, uh, I was able to read this PDF and uh, plot out the details on the map regarding uh, Karen's disappearance, right? Um, when she went missing in 1985. Um, this is Karen, by the way. This is Karen Wilson. Some more pictures of Karen Wilson. Um, this is the man in Karen Wilson's disappearance. Uh, this is a man seen in the Karen Wilson's disappearance. Apparently, um, uh, you know, you could, everyone can find that PDF and read for themselves, but uh, as Karen was walking towards the university campus, there was a strange man who was actually following her. And all of these witnesses, I believe, I actually believe all three of those witnesses that saw Karen back in 1985, they all witnessed her uh, when they were driving their cars. So they were looking at Karen uh, from, you know, from their cars and I don't think they were paying that much attention, but uh, as as much of the attention that they did pay to Karen led them to all kind of see this strange figure kind of walking uh, behind her. And so this is the guy. This is the guy that we're looking for in the Karen Wilson's disappearance. But this dude looks like he's um, in his, you know, like a young man. Could be anywhere from his like early 20s to like, I don't know, maybe like late 30s but i wouldn't give this man uh you know anything over 40 uh to be honest because we're looking at the sketch right now for everyone who's listening to this on the podcast tabs and i would actually say that well, well we can do the calculations right so 15 years later this dude would probably be how old would this guy be let's let's say he's 28 so 15 years later he would be third he would be 40 what he would be 40 43 Something like that. So, yeah, still, a, I guess, still in the range of abducting people. So, yeah, that's something to think about. I think this was a, a characteristic, a distinguishable characteristic of um, uh, Karen Wilson. She had the ring on her finger. And, yeah, that's pretty much all of the, I guess, uh, you know, pictures at least that I found. Uh, when I was looking at this case this week, but I did find some news clips and um, the one I want to kind of want to go over with you guys is this one. I'm not sure when this was made, but this kind of gives us a good look into the case in general. So let's just play it. Is this Suzanne? Susie was 19, she would have been 20 on April 6th of that year. What are you doing over there? We do not w know what happened to her. It's like a needle in a haystack, she just vanished. She was late. This, guys, I had to pause it here, sorry. Uh, but for everyone who's listening to this, we're now looking at uh, the footage of... Um, 
a bus stop, right? So this is the bus stop footage. And this was interesting for me because if we would quickly jump back to, that's why I don't know when this was filmed because let's really quickly go back to the, uh, you know, uh, the satellite footage from 2001. And let's go back to the this thing. I don't see this anywhere. I don't see this bus stop anywhere. I don't see this bus stop anywhere uh, on the map, guys. Uh, look, uh, we're back to the, uh, you know, we're back to the satellite footage. And goddamn, I don't see it. I don't see it anywhere. We can actually do some, we can progress it back to 1995, but the resolution is very bad. And uh, if we will go to like 2003, that's why, that's why uh, you know, I guess we can't really gauge exactly like the location uh, where um, Suzanne disappeared, unfortunately, because it seems that, uh, it seems that only, let's see, yeah, it seems that this right here, it seems that this plot of um, land was only turned into a parking lot in 2001, so this couldn't have been the parking lot where the ID card was found back in 1998, because it was not there anymore, you know what I mean? Back in 1998, this thing was just some grass, some woods. So this this, this really effed me up, because I was like, I was trying so hard to find the location anyways let's go back to the let's go back to what we were doing sorry about the disturbances Last scene uh getting off a bus at the collins circle near the visitors parking there was an old employee id badge found uh, two months later off the visitors parking lot in kind of a grassy area what is the visitors parking lot what is that guys do you have any idea what the visitors parking lot is at the university at albany downtown uh, campus. If you ever been there, please let me know. It had been out there for quite a period of time. When her dorm room was looked at later, it looked as if she was coming back. Dorm room looked as if she was coming back. What does this tell us? This basically tells us that it seemed that she was trying to get back home. Now, this would obviously play into the abduction theory uh, that she was abducted one way or another. You know? Make straight pieces of hair look curly. Her hair dryer was on the bed. Her all her personal items were still there. She had a she had money on top of her desk. Change money. But her ATM card was used the the, the day following her, you know, her disappearance in a, a convenience store that you know was, was one that she wouldn't she wouldn't have gone to. Okay, so it was used in a convenience store where she wouldn't have gone to. This is the father's quote. Doug Leal is saying this. Which was about two miles from the campus. The password was a direct hit. Her boyfriend uh, was the one. Uh, Rich told us that, uh, that she was missing, and I, uh, I believe he said, did you know that... Uh, Suzanne didn't come home last night, or something to that effect. Hi. Okay, so something, uh, something uh, for homecoming. For homecoming. <laughs> Rich uh, cracking jokes right here. Um, but yeah, this guy has been the center of attention. Uh, this dude, Richard, you know, the boyfriend, the mother was saying that, yo, he was possessive. Apparently, this guy had somehow set up Suzanne's uh, computer so that he could actually access it remotely. Now, they both were kind of computer, uh, very interested in computers, so maybe it was just something fun to do. But, you know, uh, I don't know. I guess we can look at this guy. Like, does this dude look like someone who would kill someone? Because let's be honest, this guy is the main person of interest in this case, at least according to the family members. Uh, of Suzanne, so does this guy look like he could murder Suzanne? What I mean? Oh, sorry. It's disturbing to us that uh, that the family and Susie's boyfriend, Rich, uh, choose not to uh, answer questions at this point to to maybe illuminate or to to revisit some of the 
some of the unanswered uh, questions. I want her back. I'm frustrated with my eyeliner and your videotaping. Mm. I don't care how I get her back, but I want her back. Damn. Yeah, okay, so those were the general, uh, I guess, uh, you know, visual assets that I found interesting this week, and uh, I guess we can jump to the next chapter of today's podcast. Right, so I think uh, one thing that is uh, interesting for us is the fact that Suzanne's mother actually recalls that the last time she spoke to her daughter back on the 1st of March, Suzanne told her that she had problems with her finances. And when the mother offered some money, uh, Suzanne declined. And Suzanne withdrew uh, from her you know, debit card twice the next day. So she has, she tells her mother that she has money problems on March 1st. She withdraws two times on March 2nd. Could this mean that she was, you know, owed someone some money or like was withdrawing on a regular basis? And then she withdraws again as she's missing already, or at least someone is withdrawing again from her debit card. So who knows? But I found that pretty interesting. The fact that the bus driver did not recall Suzanne leaving the bus was pretty interesting to me, but then again, we have that eyewitness account of Suzanne's friend who witnessed her exit the bus at the Collins Circle bus stop. Um, I, You know, it's hard to say because, well, it's really hard to say if she did manage to get back home uh, to the uh, Collins Circle or not. Uh, I guess it's up to debate, but at least that eyewitness account stated that, uh, you know, she was seen there, but, you know, it's it's anyone's guess, I guess, at this point. Now, her roommates are pretty certain that Suzanne did not make it back home on the, 20, on the 2nd of March, because if she had, they would have heard her keys and fobs jingling around as they normally did when she would return home. So, this and I kind of think, yeah, I, I I know of certain situations like that where you would kind of just get so familiar with a certain noise. Um, so it's interesting. I, I really don't think she returned back home. And once again, uh, investigators looked at her apartment, uh, at her dorm, and there was nothing indicating that she had returned but there was nothing indicating that she would not want to return also. Everything was kind of still there, so it seemed like a weird disappearance for sure. The next day, her debit card was used at an ATM at that steward's shop at around 4 p.m. The steward's shop, as we've looked at, you know, the screenshots from the Google Maps, it's around um, 2.7 uh, 2. 2. miles away. Um, now, Personally, and I just want to quickly disclose this, I think Suzanne is making those transactions because of these details. Um, it The withdrawal amount was $20, which was the amount that Suzanne would withdraw on a regular basis. The PIN code was also entered correctly uh, on the first attempt. So these two details... Uh, make it seem to me that, you know, she was the one who was actually, you know, getting the money out. Now, there's a whole line of thinking, and I think we'll get into it a little bit later on, about potentially Richard having killed Suzanne or abducted Suzanne, did something terrible to Suzanne, actually going to the store and um, trying to get $20 out because he would have known her pattern of taking the 20s out uh, maybe in some sort of a you know attempt to make it seem that she's all okay and she just ran away and she just continued on living her regular life or whatever you know that's the whole line of thinking right there but I think it's um, first of all 20 bucks do not indicate that someone's you know like just trying to run away or something like that. They would probably take a lot more money. And also, why would Richard, 
of all people go and implicate himself like that like there's scammers all around like richard is a smart guy he does computer stuff like he would he really be that bold yo i'm gonna just go into this atm inside of a convenience store with uh, cctv footage footage all around and you know attempt to get this you know I, I don't know it just doesn't seem like to me the research i don't think i really don't see any way that um he could have gone and accessed the you know the the debit card i guess one thing that would kind of work uh, in this uh, in favor of this theory that you know uh, he was the one who actually went and accessed the atm was the fact that the clerk did not recognize Suzanne. But then again, did he recognize Richard? I'm pretty sure the clerk was also asked about Richard. So, um, you know, take it for what it's worth. Now, the potential stalker that was stalking Suzanne was very intriguing to me. And this came from Suzanne's co-worker and apparently Suzanne told this person that about a month before her disappearance, she believed someone was stalking her. And you know some digging online? Actually, yo, there's something coming up, guys, for sure. Like, like one, one line of thinking is coming up. And obviously there's a whole ton of like... Uh, implications uh, regarding Richard having something to do with Suzanne's disappearance and most of these are coming I believe from the family members uh, you know I think one of the fact I guess we can start off that the police have never been able to entirely rule him out as a potential suspect in this case which is pretty interesting um, also according to uh, the mother uh, you know, Suzanne tried to end the relationship with Richard on multiple occasions, which is also it's not a good look for Richie, you know what I mean? Richard told police that Suzanne was his fiance, and uh, no one knew this, and I'm not really even sure if she was the fiance. I'm kind of getting a strong suspicion that she wasn't his fiance. But then again, this would kind of make it seem that Richard is like really on that dope at this point when he's making these statements. Richard's alibi was also quite questionable. Apparently, he was with his parents in the, you know, the parents' home. And he was playing video games with his friend who was, um, you know, I guess uh, playing an online game where they weren't in the same place. Like it was all... Uh, true distances like remotely so um i'm not really sure what kind of a game this was back in 1998 there weren't all that you know the games back then weren't all that interactive where like are you certain you're playing with the right person so once again i didn't find uh, any information regarding like what kind of a game this was uh but you know it's like the the whole thing like i think it would still be very hard to fake it, like uh, for the for Richard to potentially fake him playing the game, like for him to run some sort of a program that fakes uh, the gameplay on his end. I think it's a stretch, but I mean, you know, who knows? Who knows? And uh, obviously, the fact that he uh, declined to take a lie detector test um, was something that rubbed off uh, Suzanne's family the wrong way. And he stopped cooperating, according to Mary Leal. He, you know, Mary strongly believes that Richard knows more information that he's uh, letting off, uh, you know what I mean? And uh, uh, Richard's mother in 2020 said that Richard is already done with this case. He's like, yo, I'm move he's, mar he's married, he moved out. He has a whole nother life uh, that he's living at this point. And, uh, you know, law enforcement, uh, believes that this is a homicide uh, they don't think it was like a runaway uh, law enforcement is treating this as a uh, as a you know murder potentially and uh, yeah I think this is these are were like the notable uh, details of this case this case has a lot of different details and it took me like so long to like just write everything down and yeah this case like uh, it's hard to describe this case it goes into like a lot of different avenues a lot of different angles but those angles don't seem to lead anywhere like the atms uh the you know the id card uh what else like 
you know, all of these other uh, occurrences, like the the boyfriend is apparently abusive, but who knows if he's abusive? Like, you, it's really hard to gauge what's happening in this case, but. I think now it's a good time for us to jump to the theories. All right, so uh, I think it's important to go back a little bit, and I'm gonna share my screen again, to Reddit when we were talking about the theories, what could potentially have happened in this case. So once again, two times in a row, just like last week with Alex Slowly's case, I found some pretty uh, damning uh, comments on the Reddit. Um, so I was br browsing through Reddit and I saw this comment by a user named Big Sky Francis, and he said, quote, some of my big brother's friends are close to Richard Condon's friends. They have told him that Richard Condon would get tipsy and confess to the murder. He did it several times in the early 2000s, Richard has never told them why he did it. He will not talk about it anymore, even when he's drunk. This surprises them, as they say that Richard is a nice guy. And we have a follow-up comment from Samoya95, who said, I heard the same thing from people that know Susie's family. The police told them about these confessions just a few years ago. The problem is that these guys will not testify against Richard in court. So uh, allegedly to these, uh, according to these Reddit comments, Richard would get tipsy and would confess to his friends that, yo, I killed that Suzanne girl back in 1998. How credible are these statements? It's anyone's guess, but you know, some people on Reddit, once again, are stating some interesting things. Um, also, I found this interesting post on Reddit, I want to quickly also read it. I think it plays a big role in this case as well, just because this is coming from someone who was related to Suzanne. So this post uh, goes like this. 20 years ago, my cousin, Suzanne Lial, was reported as missing. Her case spawned several laws and regulations in regards to missing persons and spawned the Center for Hope and the yearly missing persons day held in Albany. The case has obviously been around for 20 years and I feel like me posting this might help out my family. Most of the information on the case can be found in the Wikipedia page and its references. A quick Google search also brings up mostly similar results. Now this is where it gets juicy. My suspicion based on what I've seen in the articles and heard from family members is that there's definitely something fishy about her boyfriend who refused a polygraph test and has refused to be questioned about the case. From what my family has told me, his friend, who was his alibi, had came forward and said something to the effect of the boyfriend told him to stay quiet, but at least my immediate family hasn't heard anything about that lead since. Very, very suspicious that her boyfriend, of all people, wouldn't be willing to cooperate with authorities. Now, there's an edit. I'm not saying the case is 100% focused on the boyfriend or the polygraph test, which is what a lot of what the comments on the post seem to be focusing on. It is very important to read the entire case rather than just go off, but uh, go on my observations and suspicions as an outsider. So, what this would actually mean that Richie Rich was playing those video games with the guy, but he wasn't playing, he actually went in there, Shmurda. And then he went back to the friend and was like, yo, keep quiet. Tell tell everyone that we were playing games last night and build my alibi for me. Now, I don't think this is a very likely occurrence as, uh, you know, someone who's like, if I'm 20 and one of my friends like kills someone and, and says like, yo, tell them we were playing games. I'm going to definitely like be like, yo, no, 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 like don't. I'm not doing any of this. So just the, the fact that um, the friend came to police and actually verified the alibi, I don't think this is, I mean, I don't know how likely this is. Once again, I would need to like look into the, into the friend. I'm not really sure. I don't think, you know, the friend is 
uh, it's public information who the friend actually was. But this, this Reddit post right here, well, I would say comments were very intriguing. And I think this like kind of really sparked my interest when I was reading to go down another rabbit hole potentially. And I quickly want to read out uh, what some people on the comments uh, are saying. And this is basically in relation that Israel Keys, uh, you know, the very well-known serial killer may have potentially uh, had something to do with Suzanne's disappearance. And uh, there is some information regarding this. So um, Peppercake21 on Reddit uh, posted that there is informed speculation that Israel Keys met women in online gambling. Her boyfriend was into online gambling, wasn't she? Uh, wasn't he? Whatever. Also, Lorraine Courier thought she was being stalked. We know Samantha was. I think these are the victims of Israel Keys. It's the reason that she purchased a gun. He definitely used the victim's debit cards, lived nearby. I'm gonna say Israel Keys is involved. Been listening to the amazing podcast True Crime Bullshit. It's the name of the podcast. Um, some other commenters, Mystic Mystery 22, also stated that serial killer Israel Keys, his computer showed that he searched Suzanne Leon. Interesting, considering Israel had a home in upstate New York. I'm not really sure uh, if he searched about Suzanne Leon, Leon before she was murdered or after, I believe definitely after. Because um, we'll look at like the timeline of Israel Key's um, crimes just in a minute. And I think it will even paint a better picture for people who are not really aware about Israel Key's timeline and how he would connect potentially in this case. Um, another commenter also stated that he, meaning Israel, has also used a victim's ATM card in a possibly similar manner in at least one known case, the Samantha Coing case. Uh, IIRC, I don't know what that is, he did a test withdrawal using the pin he obtained by threatening, uh, threatening her. He then went out just to withdraw a small amount to confirm that the pin was correct before killing her. So, you know, and then, yeah, and then also uh, Israel Keys enlisted in the army in Albany, so he actually knew Albany area. So these comments, these comments greatly sparked my interest. And I want to read out one last Reddit comment regarding the Israel Keys potential connection in this case is that um, the comment goes, a stranger holding Susie captive could probably get that information out of her without too much difficulty. This is basically just replying to the PIN code, like how would Israel Keys would know about the PIN code? And also the comment goes, that is exactly what Israel Keys did with Samantha Coing. He withdrew 20 bucks the night he abducted her. A lot of circumstantial evidence in this case points to Keys and a very carefully planned out abduction. Uh, and then there are some points. So the first point would be Keys alleged he became, quote, two different people back in 1998. So I guess this is Israel Keys' words. You know what I mean? Keys was living nearby in Constable, New York. Suzanne's name was found on his computer. Keys had a history of stalking his known victims, Samantha Coing, and uh, through the and the couriers. A woman who works as an attorney for the DOG told the FBI she believes she had a scary interaction with Keys in a Marshall's parking lot in Albany, New York, back in 1998. Keys appeared to be stalking out the victim as she put items in her trunk. And for everyone who's not aware, this is Israel Keys. We are on his Wikipedia page right now. He was an American serial killer, bank robber, burglar, arsonist, kidnapper, rapist, and necrophile who murdered a minimum of three victims across the United States from June uh, 2011 to February 2012. While awaiting trial, Keyes committed suicide by hanging and slashing his wrists. So this is Israel Keyes, and I've heard about this guy brought up like, this guy was brought up a lot of times uh, during uh, 
other cases that you know we've covered on this channel um now i, I was looking into the israel keys connection and you know uh the the podcast called uh, i just want to shout them out once more uh the podcast called um what was the podcast called uh Oh, uh, sorry guys, podcast True Crime Bullshit, True Crime Bullshit is the podcast name and I think this is their timeline uh, and I was, I'm not sure, I think this is their content, anyways, right now on the screen we actually can see the timeline of like Israel Keys uh, previous crimes, right, and we can see that Israel Keys was born on uh, January 7th, 1978, and apparently there's nothing much about Israel Keys up until, up until 1997. Uh, 1997, Israel Keys claimed he abducted a teen girl in late afternoon, late evening on the Deschutes River, okay, she was tubing with her friends when the abduction occurred, he sexually assaulted her and then let her go, uh, let go, uh, let her go, tube down the river. The victim is believed to be between 14 and 18, and Keyes said her name was something like Lena or Leah. Investigators believe the case was never reported to law enforcement. Keyes was living in Maupin, Oregon at the abduction, most likely took place at Maupin or whatever. So this, there's not a lot of information, right? And now this is where uh, Suzanne, the following year, Suzanne disappears. Suzanne, Suzanne Leol disappeared after getting off the bus. Uh, we all know the case by now, right? And then on uh, in July of 1998, Keyes enters the military. And Keyes served in the military from 1998 to, uh, you know, July 2001, uh, when he was discharged from the military service. So if Israel Keys was responsible for the murder and the disappearance, uh, you know, it must have happened fairly, like, like just, just before he enlisted into the military service. So who knows? And the fact that on his computer, there was... Suzanne's name, so he googled Suzanne. This definitely happened afterwards, I believe. So after Suzanne was like, after she disappeared, he definitely googled her. Now, why did this guy google Suzanne? I don't know, guys. You let me know. And yeah, I think I'm definitely gonna wrap it up this week. Um, as for my personal take on this case, it's pretty hard to say what happened to Suzanne. Um, I wish I had more time to investigate uh, various details and maybe have the podcast a little bit more structured. Um, initially, my line of thinking was that maybe Suzanne was actually seeing someone else because I was I strongly believe that Suzanne was the one who uh, used the uh, ATM the following day because it was 20 bucks and uh, she knew the code and I just got a sense that Suzanne probably used the, the code herself. Um, but then when I looked into the Israel Keys connection, I know that the uh, podcast, uh, True Crime Bullshit podcast, they're probably, uh, you know, if I, to make any sort, some sort of a conclusive uh, speculation or like some, to speculate what might have happened to Suzanne, I would definitely need to look into that Israel Keys connection um, currently. I'm just not gonna, uh, you know, say anything regarding that because you know I didn't listen to the podcast. I bet there's, I bet if I listened to their podcast, I would probably become a believer of this theory. Um, so that's pretty much it. That's pretty much all for this week's show, guys. Let me know what you think about this week's episode. Um, it was a big case, a big chunk of information. Um, I hope this was um, enjoyable. And as always, guys, I'll catch you on the next week's episode. Until then, just stay safe and peace out.